And I'm happy to um, start our first webinar about the very important topic, upholding human rights in Kazakhstan in times of uh, COVID-19. And I am really, really appreciate that uh, um, Roberto Rampi, as a member of uh, Parliament Assembly of Council of Europe, who was in Kazakhstan, uh, who is monitoring the situation constantly in, 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 in Kazakhstan and many other countries, but also who experienced himself, as many of us, uh, unfortunately, what has been a uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 in, in every country, uh, would listen to civil society voice, first-hand information, uh, also, we would later greet um, uh, Robert Rampi, or oh, sorry, um, uh, Brando Bonifay, a member of European Parliament, who also monitors the situation in, in uh, many countries, and especially now would be focused uh, and listening to the stories of civil society uh, from, uh, from Kazakhstan. I would like immediately to give the floor to opening remarks to Roberta to say hello to our speakers and then we will pass the floor to, to civil society and human rights defenders. Yes, thank you very much because I believe in that uh, strange, strange period uh, also the webinar and everything like this is uh, an instrument and a way to continue our uh, work and our uh, capability to hurt people. And I believe it's very, very important. I thank a lot uh, Open Dialogue for that, uh, because uh, for many years uh, we understand and we are able to do something for many people around the world, uh, a prisoner or people who fight for their rights and for the rights of, of every one of us, because we have uh, something like uh, Open Dialogue that is uh, able to uh, stay in touch with people uh, on the field, uh, with people in the country, all, all around the world, and to uh, stay in touch with them. And so let us understand exactly what is happening and what is happening to people. And I believe we all uh, fight for human rights all around the world. We really believe uh, we have to um, do more and more to have uh, human rights all around the world, but to understand exactly uh, what is happening and how our work is working, we need to stay in touch with people. So thank you very much. I believe it's very important and is important also today to understand, to hear people, to hear civil society and to understand from civil society what we can do and what we succeed in and what we have to change to have more results. Thank you, thank you, Roberto. And now I would like to give, um, to give the floor to a prominent human rights defender before she uh, had a medical education. So uh, Dana Janai, please, floor is yours. And my first question, Kazakhstan has one of the largest borders with China. When were the first reports of COVID infected in Kazakhstan? Did the model of China's behavior in hiding the numbers of infected serve an example for Kazakhstani authorities? Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ludmila. Um, I want to say just right away that until the moment I became a human rights defender, as you said, uh, my profession was uh, dentist. Therefore, um, I express solidarity with everyone, a medical professional who actually fights with his or her bare hands for the lives of our citizens. Um, in Kazakhstan, the fight against infections was not led by medical doctors, but the um, National Security Committee and the law enforcement agencies. Uh, following the example um, of China, the Kazakhstani authorities, uh, um, Kazakhstani authorities resorted to a censorship of information concerning uh, the spread of um, infections and uh, problems in combating it. The first reports of coronavirus infections in Kazakhstan appeared at the end of January 2020. They were reported by medical professionals and pharmacists. This was uh, immediately followed by the reaction of law enforcement agencies who labeled this information false and began to prosecute medical doctors. 
these persecutions has become another confirmation that Kazakhstan tried to conceal information about patients infected with coronavirus. And uh, now I will mention uh, two cases out of dozens reported cases. First, it was on 29th of January 2020. It was in Aktobi in the west of Kazakhstan. A pharmacy is reported on the social networks that three uh, Chinese citizens with coronavirus were identified in the city. Reportedly, they were held in a residential building and were not taken to a hospital. The pharmacist was detained and after interrogation, she repented. She was accused of disseminating normally false information. And the second uh, case, it was on 30th of January 2020, when Kazakhstani medical doctor, Duman Aijan, of his name, warned um, his uh, friends about dozens of detect detect detected cases of coronavirus infection in Almaty. Uh, thus, uh, the authorities severely persecuted those who, uh, at the end of January, spoke about the appearance of coronavirus from neighboring China, with which Kazakhstan has a long border and close ties. At the same time, against the background um, of these reports between 29 of January 2020 and the 3rd of February 2020, Kazakhstan suspended bus rail and air connection with China. Thus, it was confirmed that at the time, infections in Kazakhstan could indeed have been identified. However, they were cancelled. Uh, in, uh, in addition, uh, for example, on 1st of J February 2020, uh, the president of uh, Kazakhstan, Sakaev, announced uh, the government's decision to provide China with humanitarian assistance to fight the coronavirus. And at the same time, Inside Kazakhstan, the authorities failed to properly prepare for the epidemic. Um, medical workers, just like other citizens, were not provided with personal protective equipment. Doctors stayed in medical institutions around the clock and worked overtime. All this caused a large number of infected doctors. At the same time, neither the government nor the president of Kazakhstan, Takayev, provide regular and confirmed data data on this issue and according to official information in early april 2020 there were 211 infected doctors it's about 21 percent of all cases and already in june 2020 the minister of health announced about 1904 infected doctors it's about 12 percent of all infected uh, and at the same time, the authorities did not officially recognize the presence of coronavirus in the country until 13th of March 2020. Um, let us not forget that on 11th of March 2020, the World Health Organization announced the pandemic. And two days later, the Minister of Health of Kazakhstan, uh, Yeljan Bertanov, announced the import of coronavirus into the country, namely the first infected person who arrived from Germany. Germany? And, yes. And okay. later, Kazakhstan state propaganda emphasized that the first patients arrived from European countries, including Italy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sounds similar to the whole propaganda uh, repeated also uh, by mm -hmm. Russian propaganda media or, or, or others in many countries. So, Takayev government um, reported billion dollars funding from the state budget, including mm -hmm. uh, for payments for doctors. What support was provided to medical professionals, if you followed, of course, uh, for this issue? Um, Authorities have announced that they would pay bonuses to medical doctors who are involved in anti-epidemic measures. However, it transparent uh, that the bonuses were provided only to those who work directly with infected patients. This approach seems to be discriminating and ir irrational because it, if someone from the work team has contact with infected persons, then other members of the team are also at risk. At the same time, a case was recorded when the bonuses were not received even by those who had direct contact with infected people. Maybe you can propose some uh, example of this kind of uh, situation. I mean, do you have concrete example of hospitals where it happened? Uh, yes. So, for example, doctors who did not receive bonuses 
uh, held protests in several cities of Kazakhstan. Uh, it is, um, uh, for example, employees of the Mangistau Regional Hospital uh, stated that the leadership began to threaten them with dismissal after uh, they complained about their problems in a video message to the president, Takayev. In particular, the medical doctor supported that they had received only part of the salary and they had been given sore milk as compensation. Yeah, sore okay. milk, even more sore milk as compensation for their round to clock work. Also, one of them, it's um, Silgan Muhammadov, was uh, threatened with criminal persecution. Okay, so how much did, did the public in Kazakhstan become aware on danger of uh, COVID-19 after a pandemic was uh, declared at uh, World Health Organization? How did the state keep records on those infected and killed by COVID-19? And what has it led to so, so far? Um, on 15th of March 2020, a state of emergency was introduced throughout Kazakhstan, which was in force until 11th of May 2020. As in other, uh, as in, as, uh, in other authoritarian, um, authoritarian uh, states, officially Kazakhstan has a very low mortality rate from coronavirus infection. It's approximately 0.4% of uh, as of early July 2020, which may indicate uh, the manipulation of statistics. Uh, in order to decrease the number of infected people since June 2020, authorities have uh, seized it to include in the statistics those who have an asymptomatic disease. It was also reported that patients with pneumonia are not included in the statistics of coronavirus incidents. Since the um, beginning of June 2020, Kazakhstan has seen a significant increase in the incidence of pneumonia, up to 2,500 cases per day. Uh, and however, the test uh, for coronavirus in patients with pneumonia is supposedly negative. And on July 17, 2020, after public pressure, authorities said that they would combine statistics on coronavirus uh, and pneumonia only from uh, 1st of August. In fact, um, this is another reason for manipulation. We receive reports that an average of 15 people uh, are buried in Aktau for pneumonia per day. This is just one funeral agency. And in Shimkent and Almaty, more than 200 people are buried per day. And official statistics say that uh, we can, we have only slightly more than 500 dead since March 2020. Uh, cases were recorded when law enforcement agencies threatened relatives of coronavirus victims with criminal liability if they disclose details of their deaths. In addition, Journalists found that in Almaty, uh, the number of graves in uh, places designed for burial of victims of infections were three times higher than official mortality data. Um, Kazakhstan ranked fourth globally as regards the number of PCR tests per 100,000 people. However, the detection rates of infection are several times lower than in other countries. Uh, on 29 of June uh, 2020, Takayev, president of Kazakhstan, acknowledged that the test systems used by Kazakhstan and PCR studies may be of poor quality. If you allow me, I would like to ask our uh, colleagues to put a short video. Mm -hmm. It's around 30 seconds, but I think it would, would show the reality uh, where Kazakhstan is now with coronavirus. Yeah. So we see uh, the city Aktau. Now we see the airport of Shimkent. Um, there is a, some short videos where we, people standing on the streets without transport. This is aligned to X-ray analysis in October across the country. Medical literally treats there uh, and with the bare hands without any medications. And here you have 
short short video which shows uh, how authorities put medicians uh, just on the side of the road um, you know to, to make a medical salute we, we call it as a medical salute to the human defenders because unfortunately instead of support medicians uh, authorities of Kazakhstan and they try to use uh, this kind of um, I would say flesh mob just to uh, boost their propaganda trying to, to show that they are supported by um, medical workers and that they are support medical workers but as Dana you said um, this is a sad reality short very um, a few seconds uh, video show the, the, the situation in, in the country so sorry to interrupt you mm -hmm. Now, uh, on this video, we see how the situation got out of control in Kazakhstan. Authorities decided to reintroduce strict quarantine measures throughout the country from 5th of July 2020. Just recently, it was uh, prolonged till August. August. At the same time, there are rumors that strict quarantine measures will be till January 2021. China's experience has proven that the concealment of relevant information about coronavirus and untimely response may lead to even more serious consequences. As a result, the virus has spread throughout the world and re reached the scale of, um, of a pandemic. And uh, what you would say, because just today and uh, uh, before also on 17th of July, um, the head of Ministry of Health, uh, Alexei Tsoi, delivered a statement on coronavirus saying that pandemic uh, situation is getting better. And it was confirmed by Dr. Dorit Nitsan, Regional D Director of Emergencies of the World Health Organization, European Office also, and Dr. Hans Kluge, Director of the WHO Regional Office for Europe. And I quote, uh, Dorit Nitsan, one third of infections have been reported in the last two weeks with epidemiological conditions stabilizing and decreasing. She noted that the Republic authorities are not only developing a number of new sanitary measures, but are also improving testing and treatment methods, as well as monitoring the population's compliance with the basic requirements for wearing masks, social distancing and limiting group gatherings of people. How is it possible that you, as human rights defenders, on behalf of uh, medical workers, uh, on behalf of patients, civil society, report an increase in infections and death, while we show friendly praises the authorities and says otherwise? Unfortunately, uh, representatives of World Health Organization do not meet with civil society of Kazakhstan uh, or don't reply to our request for them, only the opinion of the authorities is considered besides the fact that we are citizens of Kazakhstan pay at least $4 million for their offices in Almaty and Astana from our taxes every year. Um, they are therefore frankly exposed to propaganda and further spread it. Yes. I see. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for your testimonies. Uh, now I would like to switch on uh, Aigul, Aigul Pavel, prominent human rights defender uh, from Kazakhstan. And I would like to ask you, Aigul, um, about the political persecution uh, during pandemic. So we have uh, information that during the state of emergency in Kazakhstan, more than 16,000 people were detained for violating the state of emergency, of which more than 12,000 people were brought to administrative responsibility. In the first months of state of emergency alone, more than 1,500 people were arrested. What condition in detention facilities in Kazakhstan? What have these actions led to? Uh, have the police themselves been equipped uh, with the protective gloves and masks. Uh, so if you can provide this information, please. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Lyudmila. Uh, repressive actions by the government of Kazakhstan have resulted in an even greater number of infections. Meaningless detentions and the harassment put of uh, 16 uh, 
thousand Kazakhs and zero lives at unreasonable risk. The detainees were held in small and uh, overcrowded cells, which is a direct violation of quarantine measures. In most cases, uh, arrests could have been replaced with uh, fines or uh, warnings, and uh, in many cases, the court sentences were illegal and uh, political motivated. It should be noted that, that in many regions, uh, police officers uh, often did not wear masks and gloves. The police leadership forced them uh, to buy scarce remedies for themselves. Only after the public disclosure of these cases were police uh, were the police provided with masks. Okay, I see. I will. Could you please elaborate on how much you can say that political persecution increased during this state of emergency? Uh, for human rights defenders and the civic activists, uh, the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic begins at the end of January 2020, when uh, medical professionals from different cities were persecuted for uh, spreading information about the growth of infected by coronavirus. The state of emergency and the quarantine provided the authorities of Kazakhstan with additional tools enabling political persecution. The most brutal cases of uh, persecution are the murders of three activists. Uh, Dulat Agadil, who was found dead uh, the night after his arrest on February 25, 2020. It was videotaped uh, by activists that Dulat's body was covered in scars and uh, bruises. The authorities are hiding and uh, preventing relatives from giving their lawyer a video of Dulat's last hours of life, which shows him dying without assistance in a cell. The policeman stepped over him and uh, let him die. Uh, Amanbike Mirhanova, who was found dead on March 28, uh, 2020, by police officers under unclear uh, circumstances after several threats and uh, abductions by national security officers. Uh, Siri Kurazov, who was, uh, who was uh, brought uh, uh, to this uh, on May 15, 2020, uh, using uh, strangulation techniques on police officers. Besides that activists were massively subject to uh, arbitrary arrests and uh, fines for criticizing the authorities on social networks, including for their assessment of the effectiveness of uh, measures to uh, combat coronavirus. More than 177,000 of activists in Kazakhstan are at risk to be criminally persecuted for their peaceful online social activity. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to add that the case of Dulat Ahadil uh, happened just on the very first day of uh, mission of the members of European Parliament in Kazakhstan, uh, when they are, were there to um, monitor implementation of the recommendations and also uh, enhance partnership and cooperation agreement. Until now, uh, as you said, unfortunately, investigation basically nowhere. Um, authorities deny the fact that Said Dulat Ahadil was tortured and they prosecute people who actually did this uh, um, video fixing, fixing the um, signs of torture on, on the body of uh, Dulat Ahadil. So, of course, our main demand is to have proper investigation to bring to justice uh, and stop uh, impunity of those who are responsible for political murders, all of these three activists. So, but my question, uh, on what platform of social network did citizens of Kazakhstan most often communicate or exchange information after the state of emergency has introduced in Kazakhstan? Because as far as I know, most of citizens follow recommendation of the authorities to stay at home until the very end 
uh, when they were left uh, without sources for life. Mm -hmm. and, and what did activists and human defenders do at the time? Uh, what they were why they were prosecuted, fined, closed, and uh, um, <coughs> you know, prosecuted with a criminal or oh, sorry, an administrative ar ar arrests. Mm -hmm. uh, during the state of emergency, most of information in Kazakhstan was discussed and uh, shared in the Telegram chat created by the peace peaceful uh, oppositional movement, Kushi Partisan. The second uh, big... What does it mean, Kushi Partisan? It's street party, right? Street, par the street party, uh -huh, yeah. Uh, the second uh, biggest chat is a democratic choice of Kazakhstan, oppositional movement. Mm -hmm. A part of uh, Telegram chats, Kazakhstani citizens are using YouTube, uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook. But most effective and interactive is Telegram chats. Uh, it became uh, a place where activists, uh, human rights defenders, and uh, ordinary citizens uh, peacefully discussed social and uh, political issues. Uh, for this reason, authorities massively persecuted activists of the peaceful opposition movement Kushi Partisan and the participants in the telegram chat of this movement. Activists sharply criticized the government's actions aimed uh, at concealing the real extent and the consequences of the pandemic in Kazakhstan. Kushi Partis was established in various cities of Kazakhstan in February 2020. Uh, as of the 19th uh, of May 2020, there were uh, 177,456 people <coughs> registered in the chat. Authorities just were afraid such such huge uh, movement. So uh, on uh, the 19th of May 2020, the court at the request of the General Persecutor's uh, Office, secretly recognized Kushi Partisa as an extremist organization and banned its uh, activities in Kazakhstan. I just, I want to, to repeat it, secretly recognized 177,000 people as an extremist, without any questioning, without anything, right? Right, right, you are right. Uh -huh. And what then? Um, uh, next, sorry, uh, excuse me, Ludmila. Uh, and, and what then? So the court, uh, what did the court, uh, did the, the activists try to appeal? Mm -hmm, uh -huh, uh -huh. The court uh, denied the activists' right of appeal, uh, stating that they were uh, allege, uh, allegedly <clears throat> not a party to the case. Also, uh, these very activists were persecuted uh, by National uh, Security Committee and the Minister of uh, Interior Affairs uh, activists for their participation in the Kushi Partisan Movement. Uh, we have collected data on more than 200 activists uh, who were arbitrarily detained and uh, illegally uh, interrogated from uh, 19th of May uh, 2020 until the end of June uh, in connection with their support of the Kushi Party's uh, manifesto on the participation in, uh, in a peaceful uh, rails. Thank you, but this reminds me exactly the way uh, that in March uh, 2018, the authorities labeled the opposition movement, the Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan, an extremist organization. At that time, there were more than 100,000 members in DCK Telegram chat, uh, and the day afterward, all were banned. And the European Parliament has recognized the Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan as a peaceful movement. Many organizations also um, analyze that, uh, especially UN, uh, that Kazakhstani authorities abuse uh, extremist charges to prosecute and silent oppositioners. So um, since March of 2018, uh, authorities of Kazakhstan have arbitrarily detained more than 7,000 peaceful protesters. This is what 
we as Open Dialogue Foundation in cooperation with uh, humanity defenders in Kazakhstan um, recorded uh, because basically it was done on, on a basis of secret court decision banning the DC case. So what is the reaction of people to that repression policies of the authorities? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, you are right. Uh, in case of Kushi Park, just, uh, it was applied the same model as in DCK case. Following uh, the end of the emergency regime and the weakening of quarantine uh, on the 6th of June 2020, uh, mass peaceful rallies were held in uh, 14 cities. Wow. 14 cities. Uh -huh, 14 cities of Kazakhstan with demands for better social uh, guarantees against the backdrop of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, law, law enforcement uh, authorities brutally detained several hundred peaceful protesters and some of them, uh, Kanchayshir Mohamedova, Diana Mohamedova, Asya Tulesova, Maksad Bigaliyev, faced criminal charges. Uh, to conclude, uh, the government of Kazakhstan uh, abuses the quarantine regime and the state of emergency in order to silence the uh, opponents and uh, prevent uh, peaceful assemblies. It has nothing with protection of the health of Kazakhstani citizens. All that was happening in parallel uh, with adoption of the new oppressive law on peaceful assembly. You know, uh, in the midst of pandemic, uh, parliaments and the governments of democracies took urgent uh, measures uh, to uh, strengthen the healthcare system and uh, save the economy. In Kazakhstan, while in a state of emergency, authorities prepared a draft, voted, and finally approved the law by parliament and the president Tokayev. They openly neglecting all the recommendations uh, of the international community. The UN bodies, uh, the OSCE, members of the European Parliament, the US State Department, international associations uh, of lawyers and the human rights organizations have repeatedly emphasized that the law <coughs> Uh, proposed uh, by the authorities fundamentally uh, does not meet international standards, uh, unduly uh, restricts uh, the right to peaceful assembly and uh, fundamentally uh, contradicts Kazakhstan's international obligations. Thank you. Thank you, Aigul, uh, very much. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to um, Bota Jardimali. Uh, so you can say to us more details about uh, financial and governmental programs. I am. Perfect, yes. perfect, Bota, nice to hear you. I thank you for your presentation. So uh, the yeah, government of Kazakhstan uh, claim that they are continuing to struggle with the virus and the country and currently going through the unprecedented spike despite it was used billions of dollars to prevent the pandemic from spreading further. Are the resources going where they were supposed to go to and what is the level of transparency of you this money? Um. Thank you very much, Ludmila Open Dialogue, for this opportunity to be able to speak about the like, really very extremely, extremely difficult, I would say, tragic situation that is happening in Kazakhstan right now. So as Dana mentioned already, uh, we had quarantine from mid-March uh, until uh, middle of May, but then authorities had to impose quarantine again, just recently in uh, the beginning of July. And this is so-called unprecedented spike in pneumonia. It's basically uh, the government is trying to hide once again its complete failure to deal with the virus. So they have to use uh, this word pneumonia, which has became basically euphemism for coronavirus, right? And um, the, uh, the government is denying uh, that it's uh, completely failed. 
uh, uh, to fight uh, this uh, pandemic and this uh, crisis that accompanied by economic crisis. Um, I have to say for the kind of uh, Western public, but because sometimes people have these perceptions that Kazakhstan is a developing country and it's probably too poor to fight uh, the pandemic. But um, Kazakhstan is not a poor state. This is very important to remember. It's not poor by any economic indicators. It has small population. At the same time, uh, it produces uh, the amount of oil, it's an oil producing country, the amount of oil that Kazakhstan produces, it basically puts it um, among one of the top 10 oil producers in the world. And if uh, to use the numbers, we can basically say that Kazakhstan produces over, I believe, uh, six, um, 650 million barrels per year, uh, which is basically uh, if you use it per capita, we produce more than Dubai and uh, three times more than Dubai. And um, I, uh, it's very important to remember that uh, in March of this year, uh, you know, by the time when uh, we reached quarantine first time, uh, Kazakhstan authorities claimed that uh, the country had a reserves, reserves in our oil fund with the national bank, which was equal to free annual state budgets or uh, 90 billion dollars. 90 and billion. This is something, yeah, this is just reserves, right? This is, we're not talking about uh, state budget, we are talking about the reserves that Kazakhstan held. And this is something is in uh, US treasuries, in euros and dollars, in uh, gold, in AAA papers, etc. Right, so uh, some kind of liquid reserves, right, that they could sell at any point. But at the same time, uh, just uh, I think Dana mentioned Mangistau, right, and uh, that region. It's a extremely rich in oil region, oil producing region. And uh, I'll give you an example. You worked on uh, uh, quite a bit on Gen on the town of Genozien. Yes. Town of Genozien. It's an oil producing town which had economic problems for the longest time and where uh, we had um, killing of um, uh, workers on strike, right? And uh, that Genozien alone, it produces more than Dubai. And nevertheless, it has 10, less than 10 ventilators, those breathing machines that you extremely need during the pandemic for the whole city, less than 10 ventilators. So why oh, it's possible? Happening? Yeah, exactly. This is a question. And the answer is obvious. This is corruption, 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 because the proceeds of the sales of oil, they don't go like, like, like really into uh, building our health system or into, our, into building of our infrastructure. It goes into the pockets of uh, Nazarbayev's family, Nazarbayev himself, and it, uh, his immediate circle. And this is the result. What we see right now, how the government is dealing uh, uh, with pandemic, how the government dealing with quarantine, this is just everything the consequences of this grand corruption and the failure of authoritarian regime to build proper, proper institutions in the country and proper uh, system, proper infrastructure. And um, I just want to mention something, uh, which is we have now uh, two members of, of the EU Parliament. And uh, European Union, just uh, a few days ago in July, they uh, launched a, a Team Europe uh, Solidarity Package. And this is a, a Central Asian cr Crisis Response Program basically help for Central Asian countries to deal with the crisis. And uh, that, that package uh, has been in the amount of 3 million, and it's pr 3 million euros, and it's primarily focused on Kazakhstan. So Kazakhstan takes 3 million, around 3 million from EU taxpayers to fight the corona, right? But, uh, you know, considering that we have 90 billion in the reserves in the country, right? 
how this money will be used, they will be squandered. They will be squandered and put in the pockets, used to create this wonderful, uh, you know, uh, wonderful propaganda presentations and that uh, will be spent also to the trips to Europe to, pre uh, to make those presentations to uh, the EU officials to demonstrate how wonderfully the country is dealing with quarantine. Another uh, way to, uh, to use it for propaganda purposes. And, and just to kind of to put it in the context and illustrate a little bit, uh, on the 6th of uh, uh, June, uh, July, sorry, just July. recent, ju ju just uh, less than two weeks ago, uh, we had so-called Nur Sultan Day, day, day of the capital, right? And uh, that's the day of the Na Nazarbayev, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev birthday. And according to some reports, Kazakhstan spent uh, uh, over uh, two Point four, I believe, two point four million euros just to decorate uh, the city of Nur Sultan, just for decoration, while people, doctors, are dying in the hospitals or at home, while people complaining that there is no medication at the pharmacies, uh, while people cannot get basic, basic medical supplies such as uh, just oxygen masks. So uh, this is uh, how, uh, you, you know, in Marie Antoinette style, Kazakhstan celebrates Nazarbayev's birthday. And um, you mentioned about this billions of dollars that Kazakhstan... Uh, it said 13 billions, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, that President Takayev stated that Kazakhstan paid 13 uh, billion to support the population and the business affected during the quarantine which is um, approximately 8%, it depends on your exchange rate, 8% of the uh, Kazakhstan GDP. The guy have said that it's unprecedented. It's not unprecedented, it's basically in pars with what is Western countries spent uh, during the quarantine to support uh, the economies. But um, what is important to say is that 10 out of those 13 billion is uh, uh, spent in a completely non-transparent way. Uh, we actually, uh, the way how they spend, uh, I would say one thing, the economy and the population don't feel that this amount of money went into the economy. What, what happened is actually in, in April of this year, so during the first quarantine, the, uh, a list of companies was leaked a list of companies that are recipients of that um, state aid, right? Recipients of, the, uh, of those 10 billions. And who was on the list? And who, that's exactly the question. Who was on the list, right? And uh, when you look at the list, it's the, the, uh, there are only companies that are uh, beneficially owned by members of Nazarbayev family. Companies that only owned by inner circle of Nazarbayev clan, and that's it. So how uh, this money were spent, we still don't know. They basically were again taken out of the uh, state reserves into somebody's pockets. So there is no tr uh, transparent and comprehensive reports. And there is no accountability whatsoever. And, at the and same you time, gives the next three million for something we don't know for what. Yeah, no, no, how they are going to spend. We kind of uh, we, we can more or less understand where yeah. three billion went, but uh, it's again like for example, um, Kazakhstan gives uh, this support package in the amount of approximately uh, ninety dollars uh, okay. to certain percentage of the population right that as they claimed that uh, was affected by the pandemic but it's it's very little and that happened only because of the pressure social pressure pressure that civil society put on the government on the regime and that pressure was created because of the work of democratic choice of kazakhstan because democratic choice of kazakhstan from the beginning of the pandemic was explaining what kind of resource the country has, what country can do, and why it's extremely important from e even just a pure economic perspective mm -hmm. to uh, 
to support the economy, to being able to uh, 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 to maintain the demand in the country uh, from the economic point of view, why the government has to support the population, give the direct help to the population, and only because of that pressure the government provided, but as usually happens, it's too little too late, and it's, it's really something that is uh, uh, not sufficient uh, to really help people. If you allow me, Bota, uh, yeah. I would like to give short intervention for Brando Bonifay, member of European Parliament, because we discussed oh, the issue of money. And yeah. uh, um, we have this experience when, uh, for example, Mold in Moldova, um, the money disappeared and more than one billion of uh, dollars uh, disappeared in, in three days. Here we have three months. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, instruments members of European Parliament have to put conditions to monitor, to food, be sure that this money is used properly and actually to support civil society, support uh, Kazakh citizens in, in their fight for their lives during this hard time, but uh, also um, to have transparency uh, because 13 billion of dollars from national budget is a huge amount. I don't know. Um, it, it can't uh, be let like that. So. Um, Brando, floor is yours. Um, I know that you have little time, but uh, maybe you can give your overview, what you heard, and, and, and some comments. Thank you. Yes, um, today, as you know, it's a very special day. In the end, it's uh, finally the day of the agreement uh, uh, between the European governments for the recovery plan. So we are very, very tight on time. We are preparing the plenary, extraordinary plenary of the parliament of Thursday. And so I, I am really, really tight on time, but I wanted to be here anyway, because I appreciate very much the work that Open Dialogue Foundation is doing um, and uh, the work that my colleague that is here, Roberto Rampi, has been doing from the uh, Council of uh, Europe perspective. And I've been involved with you on the uh, rights of human rights defenders, their they are, they are conditions uh, and the conditions of political movements like the ones we are talking about today in the context of uh, uh, Ka um, Kazakhstan of today. Um, it's very important that the European Union doesn't make errors similar to the past of not being able to control effectively what has been uh, um, happening uh, with uh, uh, money delivered for specific projects. I have to tell you that I've been in the position, for example, to work very closely on the way that Turkey has been spending money on some projects and the parliament was able to push the commission to do the right things to monitor and control and stop the misuse of funds um, being used sometimes for repressive uh, fi uh, measures uh, in a way that was completely out of scope for what has been uh, uh, put in place for cooperation. We know, uh, and in fact, we wanted to do some uh, a visit before the COVID-19 crisis has exploded. We know that there is a sensitiveness uh, uh, with the Kazakhstan authorities to um, the image and the relation that they have with the, with the European Union. And so that's why we must be tough. We must be clear that we cannot continue. And the parliament has expressed itself also very clearly recently, you know, and you also mentioned it earlier, um, uh, uh, that we cannot work uh, without uh, having a better environment for a free press, free association. Um, uh, if we want to have a deeper relation, we want uh, some um, uh, 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 um, uh, rights and uh, democratic guarantees to be in place. Today, we know that we are also still in a moment where uh, we think that we can, for various reasons, uh, influence in a positive way, the way that uh, the uh, Kazakhstan authorities uh, uh, act. And so I, I think that we must keep a strong pressure and we must not lose sight as we are into this deep trouble as Europeans to find solutions for um, the recovery of our continent that we, and we are doing that in these hours, that we don't, do not forget to keep a high standard for uh, any kind of cooperation that we do 
with uh, uh, some uh, countries, especially those, I want to be very frank and realistic, especially those like Kazakhstan are um, not superpowers. And so we have uh, a, a larger possibility to influence than countries that are um, less uh, affected by decisions that we might take on uh, our bilateral relations for trade, for economy, etc. We can do it in this case. We can do it more effectively than, than with other countries. So we must go on with that when now we will look into the MFF, the new multiannual financial framework, our negotiations also from the parliament side. We need to keep this uh, very high uh, and clear in uh, the work that we do in terms of how also the cooperation and the money being put in it with the larger neighborhood of Europe is being spent and also so with Central Asia and with, uh, with Kazakhstan because we need to push in the right direction so that things can change and I really want to thank all the work that you have been doing in these years the work that we have done together and let's go on in this direction and let's not uh, uh, make uh, errors like there were in the past, errors that are linked to short-termism in the minds of the governments. The European Parliament, first of all, and the Commission, if it takes the right attitude, can look at the medium-term interest. Exactly. That is toward the one yes. of keeping, of keeping um, uh, a high standard in the relations with the other, with countries like, like Kazakhstan, not to concede on our on our values thank you very much and uh, thank you thank you so much thank you Brad. thank you so much words is the music to my ears really <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> thank, you. Wow. thank you and good luck with your with budget with your budget so Bota, let me continue yeah. please i would like to ask you what countries and uh, uh, on which scale humanitarian aid was provided to Kazakhstan anyway, because a, a part of these billions of dollars which were invested from national budget and how they were used, if you know, of course. Yeah, um, I probably don't know uh, such details how, how uh, the aid was used, right? I know that uh, there are 12 countries, at least 12 countries that provided humanitarian uh, aid to Kazakhstan, right? And this is US, China, Japan, Turkey, South Korea, etc. Right. And uh, the aid was uh, different, right, from the computers for lap laptops for uh, now for distant learning for the kids, right, that was actually provided by uh, open dialogues, home country, form <laughs> home country, port, right to yeah. um, a lot of just medical supplies and, and uh, some financial aid, right? But uh, what is important to remember, this is an embarrassment for our country to be in a position when we have to receive humanitarian aid in this situation, because we had time to prepare uh, during so-called first quarantine, right? To no. prepare enough for uh, everything what happens because everyone expected the second wave. But uh, in our case, the second wave is actually happened. It was delayed first wave, right? That is happening right now and happening extremely dramatically. And I think Donna provided us with some numbers. And if you even looking at these statistics, you understand how how uh, dire the situation is in Kazakhstan. And I want to say just just to illustrate again, just to put things into perspective, when Kazakhstan receives financial aid from another country, so receives something like three million. Like, like, like some laptops, etc. At the same time, on the other hand, uh, the, the regime increases the budget for uh, the National Security Committee, which is a former K KGB, right? It's uh, um, uh, basically secret police that exists only to prosecute the dissent, only to, um, to really go after the opposition, go after uh, the girls that we just listened to, our human rights defenders, going after people like me, right? Yeah. And um, if you remind, if you allow me, I want to remind that during uh, the last months we had the prosecution of uh, 
Anna Shukeyeva, Yelena Semyonova, Dana Janai, Altnay Tuksikova. Uh, this is like the most prominent human rights defenders in Kazakhstan, in different cities, and they were highlighting and uh, uh, basically informing civil society and society in, the, in, in general about tortures, about prison conditions, in, uh, and uh, the th threat that uh, COVID-19 can spread far from, uh, uh, you know, these detention facilities, and, and a lot of people can die. And unfortunately, what, what happened with them? They were threatened. Some of them were summoned. Some of them uh, has, like Yelena Simonova, already eight uh, civic and criminal cases. Uh, and uh, the main demand is to silence, of course, from the side of the government, to silence these human rights defenders. And it's absolutely unacceptable. Yeah, and, and in parallel, it's it's just, this is what's happening in Kazakhstan and uh, uh, members of the opposition abroad, uh, they experience as well, they, uh, they increased pressure because uh, this is, uh, for example, right now, what is what, what I personally experience in is a wave of uh, derogatory uh f false articles so uh, full, uh, full of fake news and and this is like, like on unknown uh websites right and this is what we kind of uh people like me who have already experienced dealing with this type of state propaganda with the, uh, black pr we basically say oh they receive the budgets so the budgets to fight us uh, p p people who are um, members of the opposition and going for the regime change in the country. Uh, but it's not only about propaganda, it's also about misuse of mutual legal assistance, which is also a costly procedure. And they basically go for members of opposition, family members, yeah. threats around the world, Absolutely. which is extremely costly. Absolutely. And this is also the budget but, of National and, Security and, and this Committee. is happening all the time. So. You, you yeah. know, it's a time of crisis when people don't have basic mask, but basic uh, paracetamol. Uh, the government increases uh, the, the budget by 100 million, uh, the budget of the uh, state security, or, or what they say, like national security com uh, committee, right? And the threat of national security is actually in Nur Sultan. This is something that we all have to admit. This is the greedy, corrupt, authoritarian regime. This is the biggest threat of, of uh, national security. And not those activists that um, uh, Brando, uh, Aigul mentioned, those activists that want to have free press, independent judiciary, free elections, and normal democratic institution. And this is what we we're all fighting for. Okay, so how you can comment uh, the reaction of World Health Organization or members of European Parliament on the praising situation uh, with fighting coronavirus in, in, in Kazakhstan? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Luda>. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's, it's actually very sad because uh, this type of statements, it's exactly, it's a praising how how um, uh, Nazarbayev's regime is, is uh, successfully dealing uh, with uh, pandemic and they, uh, uh, and they want to use Kazakhstan as a uh, you know, uh, shining example for other countries how to deal with... Uh, One step with ahead of the pandemic. This is a quote of the head of delegation of the European Parliament in Central Asia, Fulvio Martuccello, uh, Fl which was... Martuccello, exactly, yeah. right, right, yes, right. Yes, yes, this, yes, is, yes. this is a very good quote. And um, I believe that he also, uh, as, as far as I recall, he also praised Kazakhstan's non-existence biotech sector, which is a total embarrassment for the member of the European Parliament and the head of delegation of the EU Parliament to do so. It's really, uh, it's been said a lot about uh, the behavior of the uh, World Health Organization, right? That again, like I quote Kazakhstan, that is a great example of proactive uh, proactive actions that stabilize the situation with COVID. And we right now see again that the uh, situation not only hasn't been stabilized, it's actually extremely, extremely dangerous right now in the country. And the way how it was handled is so badly that it gives a rise to a number of conspiracy theories, a lot of 
uh, among people because people say that the government intentionally poisons them because it, it, it's like for a lot of people it's hard to believe that that level of incompetence that the government is dealing with the crisis right now. And um, one thing I, I want to say, it's, it's really what uh, Brando uh, said, it's, it's, it's extremely important. And I want to say that this is at the time of internet, it's the time when we all sitting in those telegram chats, it's the time when we have a number of activists that speak English, that speak other languages, that when um, embassies, EU institutions, Western institutions can directly communicate with the members of the civil society. We are not behind Iron uh, Curtain anymore. It, it's really, it, it's embarrassing to have those, pardon my, <laughs> my English, right? It's useful <laughs> idiots uh, that keep praising dictatorial regimes. It's really those times should pass. Mm -hmm. Because uh, information like that uh, is verifiable. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, you don't want to. No, no, I just wanted to have short recommendations because I want to give the floor to Roberta to conclude and to say also, we, we heard the voice of the member of the European Parliament, but we have the voice mm -hmm. of uh, um, Italian Parliament and also member of Parliament Assembly of Council of Europe, which is extremely important institution for human rights. So we, we want right. to think what we can do together. So yeah. I want to give you floor, but first your recommendation. I, yeah. I'll have a quick message, right? Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I, I want to say uh, one thing. Then, uh, hi, hi, Roberta. After COVID crisis will pass, Kazakhstan with this low oil prices, with the current situation, with the way how the government handle everything, uh, Kazakhstan's economy faces serious, serious long-term crisis. And we as a society, as the civil society, as the members of the opposition, we, we are afraid that we will be left there alone and they will be, who they will be to rescue? China will be there to rescue us with their cheap loans, right? And only, this is something that we very much want to resist because we understand that uh, long-term consequences for our country and even in existence of Kazakh nation. And uh, we want to say that only um, our growing opposition, only vibrant, active civil society can really stop the current regime, current, current corrupt authoritarian regime from selling our country to China. Uh, but we obviously need help from the West. We obviously need help from the Western institutions. And uh, I want to say uh, one thing that we, we, we are not asking for money. We are asking, we as civil society, we are asking for uh, political help. Uh, we really want the EU, the West to demonstrate that uh, you are not willing to buy this propaganda that is provided, that, that, that fed to you by, by our regime. You know to show that Western democracies are actually willing to go after human rights violators against uh, those who participate in grand corruption. And Roberta is actually a great promoter of the uh, personal sanctions in yes, the global Union, market, specifically yeah. in, in um, in uh, Italy, right? And again, we come into the Magnitsky Act. We don't want to country to be punished for human rights violation. We want those specific violators, those who just recently stole ten billion dollars from like, like under our eyes. We want them to pay and to pay in terms of that they won't be able to hide those funds. They won't be able to travel and enjoy Europe and enjoy. Tuscany and enjoy Côte d'Azur, etc. Right, and take advantage of the uh, Western medical systems at the time when our medical system is completely in shambles. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I am asking again, like like we've been, I had those conversations with the uh, members of EU parliaments many times. We are asking again that any aid, any contract with 
country like Kazakhstan should be always conditional on the fulfillment of its, uh, its human rights obligations. And this is something that economy first, it doesn't work anymore. We see it now, it doesn't work. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Bota. Roberto, you had a lot. <laughs> So we, we would like now to hear you what we can do, what we can try to bring these messages for Parliament Assembly of Council of Europe. Because you noted that now the time when parliamentarians and governmental meet, but civil society completely not. The voice of civil society completely disappeared from international platforms. And I'm really grateful for you that uh, you and Brando listened to us uh, and, and make possible uh, this uh, uh, webinar. And I hope we are going to meet with you and other colleagues uh, more often. Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I believe that um, the point of pandemic situation is a, a very, very interesting point for all human rights all around the world. Also in a stronger country from the uh, side of human rights, we know that that situation that is a useful situation, uh, is giving problem with human rights because uh, you know that uh, the, the need that we all have to control more people can be used to have less uh, right for people. Yeah, that's okay. a problem. That's a general problem in Italy, in the USA, and uh, in UK, or every, every, everywhere. So we all know that in a country like Kazakhstan, in which one we already had problem with the, the idea of human rights and the, the idea of freedom of opinion and freedom of uh, life of people, because that's the point. Because you know, when I, when I went in, in Kazakhstan, and I was very, very, um, I, I, I look at that, that image of the video because I recognize the, the place because I've been there. I'm very involved in that. But also at that time, I was not surprised because all of you told me about that. But it's different to be there and to understand, for example, that uh, typical media like TV and something like this asked me uh, if uh, I don't believe that was uh, strange or not uh, um, uh, not good that uh, someone speak against his country. I, I remember very well that the question yeah. one journalist uh, asked me, because uh, you understand by that question that the point is very, very strong, because the point is exactly not uh, uh, believing about the, uh, the possibility to people to have different opinion, to have opinion to express their opinion, to have freedom. And I believe that the point in that moment is that that situation, like the one in Kazakhstan, but for example, the one in China or in Russia and in many other countries, is not going to uh, be better because uh, we, the European country, are importing the problems and not exporting the solution. You understand what I mean? Yes. So the, the restriction of freedom is something that is <clears throat> becoming the, the wave of the world in that moment. We are not, I believe that in, in, in 89, we all believed, we all democratics believed that uh, with, the, uh, with, with the finishing of uh, Berlin Wall and everything like that, the, the, the freedom uh, spirit will start from west going to east. Now we believe that the uh, uh, unfreedom wind is strongly going from east from west. It's west. fact. Yeah, it's fact. It's coming especially together with uh, COVID from China, yeah. the most uh, totalitarian true. state. So that's the situation and that's the frame. But I believe for that reason, for that reason, and that's my op you have to protect word. Yes, uh, in, inside the Council of Europe, we started, particularly in the socialist group, we, we had, for, um, we, we succeeded to have four meetings by distance, 
in that period, we succeed to uh, work a bit also by distance. We really want to uh, meet again by presence, and we already brought some uh, uh, documents very important about human rights and pandemic situation. So we all believe that there is that problem. And so I believe Council of Europe could be a place we already are managing about that, also with Open Dialogue. Because if we will have the October presence meeting, in that meeting we had to have a session and a situation and some movements to speak with other parliamentarians about that general situation about pandemic uh, rules on human rights. So I believe we can speak about Kazakhstan more stronger yeah. because we can let all my colleagues parliamentarians understand that that problem that we have strongly in Kazakhstan if we let that go, would it affects everyone in yeah. our country, in every one of our country. So I believe, I strongly believe that the defense of human rights is something you can have only all around the world. If you try to preserve human rights in one country, you will lose the the world of human rights. Exactly. Totally. So I believe we can do that. I believe we can uh, let the voice of civil society and people be stronger and stronger because we need that. And last things I want to say to you, yeah. because Bota, Dana, Igor, and every one of them, uh, we know that we need their voices because we know that we need to understand better that Kazakhstan is a really great country with great people, with great civil society. So I really believe that the end of that totalitarian situation in Kazakhstan is something that will happen in a few of months, in a few of years, but it will be a, it will happen because I've been in many countries and not in every country you have such a strong civil society, such a strong girls, women and men, but many women, <laughs> many women. <laughs> really strong, that will really change the situation of their country. So we just have to give them the, 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 the chance, to give them the possibility to be stronger. And we want to do that. Because I really believe in a few months or in a few years, Kazakhstan could be a very important country in the democratic world because of their position, ge geographic and strategic position, and because that geographic and strategic position could be something that only uh, uh, give power uh, to few of old men that try to, to take the power only for them. So I'm sure about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta. Thank you, all my colleagues, my defender from Kazakhstan. On this very positive note, I propose to close our um, yeah. webinar. It's our first webinar, uh, dedicated to human rights situation during pandemic time in Kazakhstan. Uh, and uh, let's keep in touch. Let's uh, check and uh, fix every single fact of the violation of human rights and uh, fight for transparency for better uh, future in, in, in your country. And afterwards, uh, we will do short also information in, in Russian for those who were listening for us for this one and a half hour almost. Thank you. Thank you, thank you once again, Robert, Roberta. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Roberta. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.